Hello guys and welcome to this episode of Heavy Metal Tones and me your podcast host Tony Evans. I hope you're having a good day out there in the world. Um, this, right now when I'm recording this, it's my birthday. Hooray! Um, you know, cake and and um, presents and so on. Been a nice day, been a great day. I managed to pick myself up a copy of um, Jeff Rotel's album Stormwatch, an Australian print. Uh, just without mooching around on my birthday as you do. Pick one up, I'm pretty happy with that. That's, I have the reissue, but I don't have the original one. Not on vinyl, anyway. But enough of that. Um, crazy stuff. Today's episode is about the new Judas Priest um, one, the album. About the new Judas Priest album, okay? So, th- we we did the big Bruce Dickinson one last week. Now it's the big Priest album this week. And where would we be without Priest, eh? It's a... Uh, a good day in the world with a new Priest album. Even the worst Priest album is a good Priest album, right? No Priest album is a sad day. And um, it doesn't matter whether you like the classic, you know, K.K. Downing and Glenn Tipton uh, lineup. You, It really doesn't matter because you're going to get um, what you get from Judas Priest is you get quality from the moment you press play to the moment the last note fades away you get absolute 110 percent balls to the wall metal quality it's not there's no lightheartedness here there's no half measures they do it with full force they always have done and the two guitarists that now um, play for them i.e richie faulkner and i have interviewed him um for his his solo band um and the wonderful andy sneep certainly don't let us down in any way whatsoever and what's amazing about this album is that glenn tipton who has been sick for a very long time now poor bugger um is the reason why he doesn't tour anymore uh, it actually plays on two so two tracks on this album um and this is the deluxe edition that you can get on all streaming platforms it uh you know, from it has the highs and has the it has even highers if you can, if you can take it, if you understand what I'm saying, right? Now, fifty years. It's been fifty plus years that uh, Priest has been plying its wares um, in one form or another across the globe, um, spreading its metal madness to all of us. Okay, and of course, the main firing um, piston behind that is is rob halford in all the guises that you get long-haired led zeppelin-esque vocals to the um the snm snm leather and whip stage to the long black coat and the nostradamus moment it's all fantastic not one moment does he ever not give 110 percent. even when albums like nostradamus which i have reviewed here i really liked it I really, really like that album. Um, I know people don't, uh, and and I've had I got some interesting feedback from that from people, particularly people I know quite well. Um, now I saw them on that tour, as I've mentioned on the show before, and they were absolutely fantastic. And honestly, as I said, whatever um, Halford and you know the guys put their their um, their name on is always a badge of quality it's like you know if you're buying a really like apple you buy an apple computer you know what you get from it you buy um uh i don't know boshed power tools or whatever you know what you're getting from it right like stereos with marantz or sony you know the quality of the build is going to be good and the history of the product is going to be good and this is the same with this okay um it's it does lead on right uh, i mean it's it's a great um addition to 2018's firepower because it sort of sounds like it's out of that gate it doesn't uh, was firepower um was very traditional and very uh very old school in a lot of ways this new album is a little more progressive although as richie faulkner says it's not to worry too much guys it's not um nostradamus again it's um it's just a little bit more than chorus first chorus solo for chorus verse chorus you know it's got longer bits shorter bits faster bits heavier bits um it sort of does change a little bit of its style throughout the album it's not as frenetic at every single moment 
um, that Firepower was, which gave you that's what was such a thrilling album about it. It was so, um, so outrageously um, fast and, and fun. And that's not to say this one isn't, because this one is amazing um, for its... For it is like it's quite a long album when you if you think about it like i'll give you the rundown of the tracks right because for me this is very much like it does jump out like the painkiller it has a very much painkiller vibe a mix of painkiller and resurrection like it really does sort of mix in so you've got panic panic attack which is one of the singles the serpent and the king invincible shield another single the name of the album devil in disguise gates of hell crown of thorns um, trial by fire, escape from reality, son of thunder, giants in the sky, and then the, the deluxe bit has fight for life, visions of circle, vicious circle, sorry, and the lodger. Now it's one hour and three minutes long, and it's their nineteenth studio album. For a band that's been around for fifty years, nineteen studio albums is not as huge as you think, is it? I mean, they've had some big sort of hiatuses in between. Um, when Rob left and and so on and um, but it just shows you that what they do bring out is they think about it, it's considered right yes not every album is going to be British Steel uh, yes not every album is going to be um, Painkiller or Stay in Class or Screwing for Vengeance um, or Turbo Lover it's not all going to be those kind of albums right there's there the album the band has to grow and so does the sound of the music that they produce. I mean, if anything, Rob has got more and more... Um, I don't know how he does it. I mean, he's getting on in life, is our Robbie? And uh, yeah, his voice is, is wonderful. It doesn't break live. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't sound engineered in the recording. It's, you know, it's, um, it's certainly... Uh, a miracle of nature that himself a bit unlike unlike Bruce Bruce's voice um, Bruce Dickinson that is um, can't quite get those notes anymore whereas Halford for some reason is just always there so an absolute miracle of nature and his um, his ability to keep him you know look not take himself too seriously and to love uh, everything there is to do with the heavy metal community, everything that comes out of his mouth is always a positive thing about community and family um, and spirit. And I think that and that comes across in this album. This album, though, is is a darker album. There is some um, interesting moments of um, pathos and um, and uh, things like that in this album. Which you wouldn't always expect. You didn't get it from Firepower. As I said, Firepower was, was like the old days. It was like going back to Screaming for Vengeance again. It was um, it was a very fast, sped-up version of British Steel. But here, um, because it's produced by... Most of it's produced by Andy Sneap. And some of it's produced by Tom Allen of um, Def Leppard and Black, and Black Sabbath fame. And Ozzy Osbourne fame. Um, it, it is really... Because Andy Sneap, not only is he one of the best guitarists on the circuit, um, but he's also one of the best producers. He is one of those people that um, is so insanely talented musically. It runs through his blood almost, like like Richie Faulkner. It's in his blood, and uh, when he what he produces is stellar. Like it always is stellar. Like when he's worked with, of course, with Sabat. I've told you that before. For he's already started. Um, you know, British thrash legends, and then you know, on to other projects, but mainly this priest, you know, filling in for Glenn, and then permanently now um, replacing Glenn. Uh, it's a very big shoes to fill, but when you listen to the album, you really hear um, the fanboy in both in, in all of the musicians. I mean, not in Heal, Heal the bass player, or or even Scott. On drums, but you certainly do with with um, Faulkner and with Sneep. You know, you you certainly do. You, you um, and one second. I don't know what I've done here. I just I will just pause that. 
One second, guys. Sorry about that. Um, new laptop error issues again. Uh, getting used to these. I moved all the files across from one computer to the other, and um, it sometimes it goes looking for a file when it shouldn't do. Anyway, back to where I was going. So yeah, the fanboy, you can really feel it and hear it in them. Um, and even when you, if you see them live, you have the pleasure to see them live, and I highly urge you to do so. Um, when they're on the stage, even if it's just when it's Sneep and and Hill and um, and um, Faulkner, before even Halford comes out, they are just grinning from ear to ear. They are like, I cannot believe I'm on stage with Judas Priest. All right, it's like every dream come true. Can you imagine? Just imagine the fun. I mean, not only the pressure, because of course, Priest fans are going to be extremely picky, and they do like with a lot of things. They they seem to have taken. Sneep and Faulkner to the hearts, and I don't see why they wouldn't because they are they're never going to be KK Downing and Glenn Tipton, but they are um, certainly worthy, worthy um, axemen to fill that space, and uh, they fill it well. They really feel that the solos are rich, the rhythms are heavy, they've always got a smile on their face, they're moving around, they're taking it lightly and f with fun, but also with a very serious note, right. Now, Andy Sneap did produce the 2018 album. Yes, he did. Um, and as I said, I think that was his, might be his first with their band. I have to, I'm double checking to that. If it is, you can see why he sort of, it was more traditional in the, in that album because he was probably just sort of feeling his way. And then this one here is much more experimental, but without scaring those fans that, as I said before, aren't looking for experimental music, although I highly urge you to listen to Nostradamus all the way through and not be scared of it. Um, you do have to give it time and you do need to sit down with it and you do need to give it respect. And you have to understand that the band, where the band was coming from at the time, uh, and just, you know, don't, don't um, push it aside like a lot of these. Um, I did for years with Maiden's, um, you know, Albums without Bruce. I was like very snobby about it, and then doing this podcast, I um, went back and listened to them and realised I've been a little bit of a silly fool because they're actually good albums and they've got some good tracks on. And Blaze Bailey's got a good voice and he's doing his bloody best. Um, and I think it's the same with um, the Priest albums. Uh, even with even with Ripper Owens on, you know, they they still make good albums. It's difficult to replace uh, Rob. Uh, for his size of personality and his range of vocals. Now, this first this album was born sort of at the time of um, COVID. They had it written and ready to go and were writing it, but COVID came along, stopped everything, and then they had a 50th anniversary tour come along, so they had to sort of also um, push it aside. It was recorded across several continents. Uh, now, um, I believe that um, S Scott... Lives the drummer um, lives in um, in Nashville. Uh, Richie Faulkner lives in Nashville, and so they recorded their parts in there. Um, and Rob Halford uh, and and lives in Arizona, but he wrote with um, Andy Sneap um, together there in Arizona. Uh, and uh, Ian Hill wrote most of his pop bass parts when they were on tour doing the 50th anniversary because um, he's stay, he's based in Europe. Um, and uh, you can sort of, uh, it doesn't come across that way in the recording. I've always been quite, um, uh, quite amazed. I thought for a long time that this COVID thing, when it pulled people apart and people recording different continents and using computers, that it would sort of ruin um, it would ruin the the connectivity of the of the sound, but it doesn't seem to have done. I think it just shows that we now can do more without having to be in the same room, and you still get the same passionate experience and the same connective experience as playing together in the same room. It's it was actually I'm quite impressed by it, to be honest with you. Um, it's yeah, it, it it I just I don't know. I think this is a this. Before I go on to the album and review it um, 
track for track. I think this is a golden era Priest album. I think this is will sit in that pantheon um, with definitely latter era classics like Firepower, um, like um, Painkiller. It, it does, I mean, Rob does use his usual vocal tropes on this album, which he does um, very, very well. So if you know Rob, you'll know that he has that. If you look, remember Painkiller, where he does the, he breaks the, the word up. You know, he goes pain, pain, killer, killer, and he goes up octaves as he does. It's the same as this. He uses that mechanism to go up the octave in the song, and you always know where it's going to crescendo in an extremely high pitch note that's going to wail um, over the solos or under the solos or whatever. And it's also extremely underpinned by a brilliant rhythm section. Okay, that they've been playing together now for a long time, twenty years, I believe, plus. And, you know, uh, I know that people sometimes l laugh at Mr. Hill on bass where he stands there and his only movement is sort of up and down of the neck. And he just rocks from side to side. Um, but it does it for him. It does it for him. Geezer Butler doesn't move around a lot. And no one says anything about that. It can't all be Steve Harris, right? Um, and but he's but he's a thunderous bass player. He's so underrated. Um, because he doesn't just doesn't sit on the uh, the root note an octave below. He, he you know he he really sort of he does a geezer and um, and, a, and a Steve and he sort of blends and moves and and um, s sort of sways and 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 bobs with the rhythm of the of the band. He doesn't just sit there and you know dump 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 no. no. No, he's not one of those bass players. He's 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 a, uh, you know, he's got textures and he's got rhythms. He's got moments of it that he that he sort of puts in there that would only be Mr. Hill. Now we're gonna say goodbye to the side, um, and we're gonna come around the other side with a track for track, um, just chat about each of the tracks, uh, and we'll see how we go from there. Okay. Hope you enjoy. Listen to some ads. I'm going to now get a, a cold drink and I'll talk to you later on. Bye for now. Welcome back, guys, to part two of the show, Heaven Over Tones, with me, your podcast host, Tony Evans. I hope you've refreshed yourself for a few minutes there, or if, if you're like me, you've just skipped the ads. <laughs> anyway, um, this is the uh, track-for-track breakdown of Judas Priest's Invincible Shield, the latest album, the 19th album, the first one since 2018. It's a great way to spend your birthday, um, having a good listen to this album. Uh, I'm not... Uh, I'm not going to go all the way through every single track to give you a lyrical breakdown, as I did last week with Bruce Dickinson. I'm just going to talk about the overall um, individual tracks and, and, and sort of musically. There is some stories behind them. Um, the, the, the first one we're going to open with is Panic Attack, the first single. And this is that one that sounds like it's off of, um, vocally, it's off of straight out of Painkiller. It's got that attack sound that the priest um, sort of really sort of gives you one, two to the solar plexus, you know, bang, bang, and over you go. Um, now, musically, it's what you get with priest. It uh, nothing different here, guys. Nothing to be seen differently. This is um, it musically. This is the most sort of traditional track on the album, and. Um, it's about apparently about the internet. So Bruce is uh, sorry, Bruce. Um, sorry, Rob. Rob has said that um, it's about the what what the internet is now. What it sh what it promised that now it sort of has avenues of darkness and 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 um, venom and and evil and 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 issues. Whereas it was meant to be uh, 
a tool for mankind and to, to far, um, better our knowledge. But unfortunately, it's been hijacked. Uh, and uh, that's what he says this song is about. Um, and I, it's, it is, you know, when you hear the lyric, it does talk about that sort of thing. But it's, it's sort of just, it does come across that sort of... Um, yeah, he tells a he tells a dark story with such a light note. Does does um, keep saying Bruce? Oh my God! Does uh, Rob? Um, yeah, you know everyone's heard the single. If you haven't heard the single now, I don't know where you've been living because it's been on every um, every media outlet you can shake a stick at um, since it was released. If you're into the scene, then you would I'm sure have heard it. Okay, uh, and then we have Invincible Shield. Um, which is uh, it's about the heavy metal family. Okay, it's a, Rob says it's about um, this is the single, second single. It's about it's about the, the shield that heavy metal fans use to protect it, their themselves and this and their fans and the bands and sort of like a little army, little family. It's their the music is their protective shield, um, and I think you know he's always been in about the metal family and. Um, metal maniacs and you know he's always going on about that using his lovely sort of um brummiest accent um it, it isn't the second single but the second album a song by the way that's the second single the second song is actually the serpent and the king so there is actually a little bit of um uh religious connotations on this album because in later life rob has become quite religious he's also producing it with um, uh, with uh, it's also produced uh, written by by um, friends of his and writers he's written with when they wrote um, Screaming for Vengeance and stuff and they're, they're again quite in Christian rock bands and so on so not that that should put you off it's not if you die hard black metal and won't go anywhere near anything Christian that's not what I'm saying I said this is universal it's just got a positive message to it alright um, same with Devil in Disguise and Gates of Hell, Crown of Thorns. They're they're all very traditional imagery um, in their music, like in the lyrics. But their breakdown of the break, the musical breakdowns in them are all different. There's some marvelously inventive um, guitar pieces, particularly in Gates of Hell and in and in Devil in Disguise. Both um, Sneep and uh, uh, Richie Faulkner uh, duel each other quite beautifully on those tracks, and and Ian Hill and Scott um, on drums absolutely, you know, underpin it with quite a veracity, quite a beautiful um, and uh, deep um, deepness to it. Now I did write a note here. Where have I written? I've written a note. Sorry, one second. I'm gonna. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. No, no, no. Sorry. Excuse me. I'm really trying to read my handwriting. And then um, you get a, a, as God is my witness. Um, again, another um, positive um, message in this lyric. Uh, you might read it other way. You might read it negatively. I've heard people saying this is an album of portent and doom. I don't read it that way. Um, he certainly could be read as an album of of um, Nostradamic kind of portent. Just because it's talking about um, the internet doesn't mean uh, that the whole album is full of doom. I mean, the person I think that made that as, uh, assumption somewhere in a review I read was probably only heard the first single. Um, but though, you know, it's quite an interesting opening salvo. It's really thumping, moving. And it has some beautiful moments where it comes into, on all of these tracks, where it comes down an octave and down a moment and eases in and has that sort of almost acoustic feel, vibe, and then back up to the um, crescendo again. It, it's, um, it is, yeah, it's a, it's a blistering album, right? Um, and then we come to Escape from Reality. Now, this is one of my picks. I've written on this, one of my picks says here, um it feel this has got um this has got 
Tipton on. I think uh, Glenn Tipton wrote this song. If I am, if I am right, yes. And it this one is quite um, a, a song that will make you think um, because he's struggling with his mental disease, which is breaking his body down. I think it's got Parkinson's. If I'm right, if I remember rightly. Um, and how he can write this song, how he can write solos on this song, it's um, it's it's about the str I think it's about the struggle he has, um, about escaping his reality that his life um, is no longer what it used to be, and you know he lived to play guitar. And now, you know he probably it probably took him such a long time to play these parts, uh, and he can't do it like he used to, and he's got to escape his reality. It's got a swagger and a funk to it. Um, it does. It makes my hair raise my arms when I when I hear this song. It's, I think this is pick of the songs on the album for me. Um, not because it's Glenn wrote it and Glenn's soloing on it, but because it's just a very poignant um, track. And I think that uh, I think that sort of vibe is. It's just. It's just great. It has a real. I've put here also, it's got a real Black Sabbath vibe, real sort of, um, a real sort of doominess, a real kind of, but some of that latest, later Iomi sound, you know, that um, sort of volume four and, um, and Sabbath, bloody Sabbath Iomi sound is what I feel in this, is what it feels to me. Um, yeah, it, it uh, it's it's. But when when both when both um, Tom and because um, Tom, I think Tom produced Escape of Reality from Reality, which is you know because he can feel that he has his fingerprints all over it because it's very much the sound that he did with Sabbath. It has that kind of um, a typical Tom sound. If you know what Tom or Alum's music albums that Tom's worked on, you really can pick them, and it sort of does come across that sort of way, very um, almost like um, Never Say Die, in fact, which I think Tom did produce. Uh, okay, yeah, it's just uh, it, it does the whole album gets your head moving, your body moving. You, it's a real party metal album, I think. If anyone was going to say what kind of genre would you call Priest, I, I would call it traditional heavy metal, but I would call it party metal as well because it's it's um, it's not so heavy that it's that people who don't like heavy metal can't listen to it, and it's not so light that people who say they like really heavy metal will think it's too poppy. It's not commercial and it's not um, it's not forced and it's not pretense either. It's like John Lydon would say: there's no pretending here they what they do is what they mean and you get that with this um this particular um album i'm just gonna read my notes hang on um it's got a real heavy epic time dynamism a spirit to it i say it's like you know when you, when you were kids and you listen to to if you were like me listen to priest when you were very young when i was about i said it was about eight i think when i first come across British Steel. My brother bought it on Carnaby Street. Uh, oh no, he bought he bought a sorry he bought a British Steel T-shirt on Carnaby Street, and then I, he had the album at home, and it sort of was at that time one of the sort of most fun and um, heaviest things I've ever heard in my life. And it, it it this album does bring that sort of youthfulness, makes me feel go back back to that time again, you know. Now, what if we move on? I've got my tracks. Okay. Okay, I've also, yeah, the, the arrangement on this album is so beautifully um, placed. You know, it doesn't sound like it's, you know, the, the mix is brilliant. There's, in all the tracks, the mix is really fluent and, and level, and everything is, you can hear everything. Sometimes with modern metal, particularly with some of this really heavy, extreme stuff, you can't hear um the instrument the in the aug the you know, the augmentation of the music you can't hear the is that not augmentation what's the word it, um you can't hear the placement of the instruments that's what i'm trying to say 
so you can't hear the drums do their bit it's always drowned out the vocal is tend up to 11 the guitar so loud that you you know the the beauty of the melody that lies within the music is lost and the bass is just disappears behind a wall of fuzz the great bass players like geezer butler like um steve harris like uh, ian hill they don't need a lot of effects i think the most that they'll use if, if they do is wah and i think that I don't think you'll find Steve uses one. I don't think Ian uses one. It might only be, um, might only be Geezer. He doesn't need to, doesn't need it, because the the the, the um, intonation that they get on their strings, the type of strings. I think they use uh, all three of them use um, round rounds, um, which are sort of heavier. Because I've had a set of um, Geezer signature black round rounds on bass years ago and. I burnt my fingers because they had this sort of graphite coating, but they were real fun and bouncy to play, really thick sound, and and that's um, what you get uh, from this album. So where was I going? Okay, I'm trying to find the track listing. Oh yeah, and then you're Son of, Thun uh, Son of Thunder and Giants in the Sky. Now, Giants in the Sky. I'm going to that one first because it's the one that I sort of think of as as a note here what do i say about giants in the sky it, okay yeah it's real rock and roll is dirty thrilling rock and roll with an epic feel to it as a sort of um the priests haven't done that very often they haven't gone the traditional old 80s metal route where they were all about dragons and knights and monsters and and also the they didn't also do a lot about um, overtly over sexual. I mean, yes, they did, of course. I mean, you can't have a song like Eat, Eat Me Alive. Um, you can read into that what you want, my friends. Uh, but it's not the typical, atypical 80s metal where there's lots of, um, you know, schoolboy innuendo. And same with this. They don't do the schoolboy fantasy book thing. Uh, but Giants in the Sky... Again, I think it's it's I my interpretation it's about satellites encircling the earth and nations watching nation and um uh, you know the, the war for space is where it's gonna be if there is a, if there is an a war of annihilation it's gonna be in space. And that's where they I think that he's talking about that in this song. Um now Son of Thunder again is just a rollicking rock and roll song with a brilliant bass line on it i think um like most bands the bass player and the drummer often unless they do solos or they're really well known like someone like i don't know cozy powell or john bonham or um you know nico mcbrain or someone like that with a big big personality they're not going to be front and center to most people watching it most people watching a band um, we'll go look we'll focus on the guitarist and the singer sometimes if you're like me you look at the bass player and, and in fact you look at all of them because i'm a music nerd but you live you tend to sort of sometimes forget bass players there which is really interesting because if you take him away um song becomes really thin the music becomes really directionless so ian does such a good job in that that he's sort of for 50 years has as never repeated himself has always sounded fresh has always kept at it, um, you know, never changing and never wavering. So much like um, um, Rob Halford, you know. And sadly, like, <laughs> before Glenn got sick and before KK retired, although now you do get KK's priest uh, going around. Mm, um, yeah, not sure, personally. But that's the end of the traditional album, the traditional album. And then we move, if you've got the special edition album, you get um, you you get you get Fight for Life, Vicious Circle, and The Lodger. Okay, now this is where we get a, a couple of um, Tipton tracks here on on this album. Sorry, I did mean to say that Sons of Thunder has a Glenn Tipton is a Glenn Tipton song 
and that's exactly why it is what it is it's powerful and heavy but also has a very glorious and i've written here again um it oozes and it's and it's and it's really um heartwarming to know that the man behind the sound of modern metal particularly um 80s metal um one of them tipton and kk downing uh, is there still you know attacking it with his bluesy swagger that he always did all right uh and that's then and then we move as i said to the bonus tracks now you know whether you get the classic album or you download it you're going to want to listen to these because fight for life vicious circle and the lodger the weakest track on the on the album is the lodger i'm going to say that out right now that was not that's written um separately with um a, sec a secondary writer okay it it's a little bit too religious for me a little bit too um yeah it's I don't know it's it's a track that we i think they could have they could have left off um between you and me listeners uh, it was written by uh, bob hallingen jr who uh, also performed with um, a celtic rock band and a christian rock band he's worked with them with scream of vengeance and defenders of the faith um and it, 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 i don't know i don't know where this song goes i'm not sure what it's about i don't know why it is there um look love it i'm sure you will there's someone out there that will say this is the best track on the album possibly i don't know i just i can't say this album is all killer no filler because it is with the original album ignoring these three bonus tracks is all killer no filler adding on these bonus tracks and the deluxe version you get all killer one filler uh with the logic now again shoot me down if you want that's your opinion you might go no tony i don't i don't agree i think this is an absolute cracker of a track but i don't know it just feels tacked on where you could easily push into the the set list you could easily push into there um uh, the um fight for life and vicious circle definitely definitely because they're very they're very priesty in fact anything they actually remind me of some of halford's uh, solo stuff um which is probably where it comes from he probably had it as solo songs and then hadn't got an album to put it on sitting around i don't know because um musically it is what it is it matches the album's pace tenacity um texture balance augmentation or um you know it 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 augmentation that's the wrong word i don't know why i keep saying augmentation arrangement i'm trying to say arrangement oh where's augmentation coming from i don't know anyway arrangement um it has the 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 feel of of a sneep classics it's got his hands all over it same with alum it's got his hands all over it but it, i like the way this album uses two producers and um doesn't skip a beat you can hear if you're very astute uh an alum a tom alum sound as i said it's got that real kind of americana um sound that tom seems to do so well it has that latter day priest sound when they were recording a lot in the states when they were really stoned it has that sort of sound um to it i think he uses a lot of um it's very well it's got quite a bit of gain uh in in his tracks whereas i feel that sneeps far more um deep deeper um sounding production a little bit more modern sounding whereas tom's is a little bit old school is that the right that's the right thing to say anyway um it's an absolute belter of an album i'm going to give it um 10 millsies out of 10 this is this this almost blows the millsy meter out of the, the mercury out the top and all, all over the floor um it does in its original format it doesn't in the deluxe print um because i don't see how i can say it is 11 out of 11 or goes to 11 with the lodger on the end um but 
this be, let's be truly truthfully honest i said right back at the beginning of the show any priest is good priest all priest is good priest having an atlas like maiden like you can't complain about a maiden album all maiden or any maiden is a good day any new priest album is a good day so you know we have to we have to hold on to this while we can i mean how many years more can a band of 50 years um, really pull it together i mean i, I mean i honestly was skeptical when kk left and when glenn got sick and i was like well i don't know i don't know where this is going to go um but honest honestly it, these two guys have just lit up uh, they, I think, like Halford said, when they both started playing again, it gave him a completely new sense of life and joy. It sort of sparked him again. Um, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? He, he suck, draws on the youthfulness. I mean, there's no way that, I mean, Sneep and Fuckno are not youthful by any means, but they're not. They're not. They're not octogenar octogenarians either. They're not pensioners either. Love you, dear Rob. But the heavy, heaviest pensioner on the planet. You know what I mean? The heaviest rocking pensioner on the planet. You and your love for cats, man. You just make us smile all the time. All the time. Um, so, where does it sit? Where does it sit in the new rankings? I'm not going to say and be or that person and say it's, you know, in my top five. Um because I haven't lived with it long enough yet. And to push out something that's been there for since I was a teenager is extremely hard to do. And I absolutely will not do it just to, to blow smoke up their asses. Um, I won't do it. I think that, um, that it certainly uh, ranks one of their better later albums. Uh, it's, it's, not as audacious and as um criminally insane as nostradamus it isn't um it isn't as speed mad as painkiller or um pain or uh firepower but it's a mixture of all three i think it has the um, halford solo career intertwined it's got um lessons learned on the road from things like nostradamus and painkiller how to write one of the greatest heavy metal songs of all time and you know in painkiller and repeat it without being a parody of yourself is really hard to do and that's a genius in this particular band is that they don't repeat they don't parody, they don't pander, and they don't um, disrespect their fans. They just don't. They don't do a Metallica. Um, they don't do a Megadeth or any of those um, bands. And and I genuinely feel, listeners, the reason that bands like Maiden and Priest and Sabbath, uh, you know... Um, have the longevity that they do is because they weren't born of heavy metal okay they weren't they were originators they had a they had a, a birth forged in blues pub rock you know um uh, pop jazz all these different things that they were uh that, that bore them to the direction that they are you know, Ozzy, I'm reading Ozzy's, you know, biography at the moment, you know, he's talking about his love of the Beatles and, you know, Priest, you know, quite, I mean, Halford is, has a huge love of Motown and it, the thing is, because that is truly a musical diversity. When you, um, oh, you know, these newer bands, it's why I feel a bit sad is that I think that they jump in young kids and they listen to heavy metal and they go, this is the, I'm 12 years old, this is my musical direction. Instead of going back and delving into where the band's past comes, i.e. Priest and Maiden and Sabbath and so on, Deep Purple, 
and they go right okay well it's blues oh, I'll, I'll have to listen to blues see if i like that see what's going on oh yeah okay there's gary moore oh i'll go for gary moore oh look there's there's uh you know steve ray vaughan oh okay steve ray vaughan oh there's steve vine and you go off on these different tangents and you grow your your musical sense but these young bands where they come in and it's like so one-dimensional uh, they you know it's why metallica to some extent and i'm sorry for big metallica fans listening to the show might switch off right now but everyone has their opinion and if you haven't switched off take a uh, this is again just my opinion um they struggled to find different direction because musically they did not i mean they tried it with things like lulu and all that stuff but that was them desperately trying to find something that they probably didn't really um, exist in their souls, right? And so, you know, the music form like heavy metal, and let's, let's be brutally honest, it, it, it can run its course. Um, and bands can become parodies, a spinal taps of themselves, if you wish. But not Priest. Not once in 19 albums, not once have they become a parody of themselves. Not once have they try to change their sound not once they haven't even sounded like the decade they're in you know sometimes with some bands a good example is Jeff Toll's A album it's very it's very electronic because it's the early 80s and it it's a stinker of an album I can't listen to that album and it's because it's they're not being true to themselves they're just oh I've got this new toy and and we're trying to we're trying to keep him with the crowd I was watching um on TikTok, uh, a Slade, uh, later an '80s Slade single, and I thought, my God, you're just trying to be, um, almost. I thought they were trying to be Def, Def Leppard. Weirdly, uh, it didn't really feel or look like Slade to me. Uh, that might just be an old man's visions of what he thinks a band should look like, but between you and me, it just didn't cut it because they were trying to be someone else. It's when bands like Priest, and I said try to maintain their their individuality and their direction they can make albums like invincible shield and firepower and painkiller and screaming for vengeance and you know all that stuff they can they can do it and they can do it with change of um personnel and not even skip a beat and change direction they they just carry on where they go and because they're smart and they when they hired those two guitarists they were so smart they picked up players that had the same nuances the same um, movements almost the same concept of musical um uh, notation and 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 in arrangement as as downing and tipton so you know they they step inside their footsteps and they just carry on it's like they took it in their strides almost like they didn't even stop and this album says to me that they'll never stop and i really hope they don't i mean obviously there's going to become a day there'll always be a day we don't want them all to be we don't want them to be you know the rolling stones do we um they need there someday there is a point when they just need to maybe hang their boots up but right now this enjoy them while they're here and this album is in its original length 10 out of 10 11 out of 11 all killer for no thriller no filler no killer no all killer no filler <laughs> um but it is the doubt digital you know extended version mm. one song but we'll give it that can't all be painkiller can it can't all be um they can't all be escape from reality or sons of thunder they can't you're gonna have to have its ups and downs and that's its down anyway it's just a shame it ends on that one for the for me for the digital deluxe version ending on um you know ending where was it sorry you know ending on uh giants in the sky is the way to do it but anyway or even ending on vicious circle to be honest would be a brilliant way of doing it but on that note i'm ending now um chat you later talk to you soon Bye for now.